Welcome to Rise of RevOps. I'm Ian Faison, CEO of Caspian Studios. And today I'm joined by a special guest, Noah. How are you? Doing great. Great to be here. Yeah, great to have you on the show. Excited to chat about Udemy and all the cool stuff that Udemy does for businesses and all the different rev obstacles that y'all go through. So let's get into it. First off, tell me about how did you get into this crazy world of rev ops? Yeah, it's not a straight path. Probably date myself here, but it's like an old family circus cartoon, which just dots all over the place and just all mis- mismatched. I so I grew up in Seattle. I started my career in sales, like in enterprise software, sold on-prem software, which came on a, a CD, much like our internet did back then as well. And it was a lot of fun. It was lucrative. It was a great intro into the technology space and enterprise stuff. It was a lot of fun. It was fast moving. It was merit based. And I kept finding myself wanting to be in the conference room that were where everyone was discussing what's going on with the business and what should we do. You know, we're having some competitors that were eating our lunch and they weren't as good. And I felt myself drawn to solving that problem versus going out and, and finding customers and eventually got into some marketing stuff and did a sidetrack into investment banking ra- very randomly. Won't even go into that, but it was a dark period of my life for four or five years. And then came back out and, and ended up connecting with somebody at Salesforce who was in sales strategy and had a background somewhat similar to mine in banking and so on. And I was looking to, to leave and look into something different. And with that background in technology, joined in. And what I kind of found was, is that that overlap between sales experience, marketing experience and, and finance skills was really applicable to the world of kind of sales op, sales strategy. And it was really interesting. We were trying to solve the bigger questions, which I always was fascinated by. And it was something that was just emerging. This was maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And it was something that was just kind of coming on the scene, this idea of what is revenue operations, I don't think was a term then. And then subsequently, I've just gone from the enterprise B2B SaaS pre-IPO startup and Look to scale those organizations and just iterate it on the role along the way. And then it's kind of developed into this thing now, which is which is really kind of funny and unique, but nothing I, I don't think existed 10 years ago, but I think it has a really big impact on organizations. And I'm starting to see it as either the go-to-market strategy and ops or the RevOps title appear all over the place, it, even in, in the structures of removing themselves just from within the business line, but reporting to the CEO or, or president. And so it's exciting. It's, it's focusing on the biggest projects that the company's facing and how to make sure it happens. So it's a little bit creativity, a little bit business experience, and a little bit of math. Let's talk Udemy. I'll tell you, we're huge fans of Udemy here at Caspian. I had one of our one of our leaders sent me a link the other day to a Udemy course and was, hey, I would love to take this. And I was like, yeah, this is great. Swipe the credit card and go take it. We're a huge fan of learning here at Caspian. So trying to figure that stuff out from the best people in the world to do it. Udemy for business obviously is really exciting for companies that are trying to figure out how to do that stuff. Can you tell me about Udemy for business and what size and scale that you see there in addition to Udemy, the entire company? Yeah, it's been crazy. So I've been there just about three years. Udemy is so unique as an organization. It blends for-profit company with the concept and the culture of a nonprofit because there's so much that's actually impacting people's lives. As you mentioned, I have people on my team that got to where they are by doing online training and cohort training to pursue parts of their career and their passions where they didn't have a background. And so the interesting point, so Udemy started as really just a marketplace by Aaron Bali and a place for people to come to connect to instructors and instructors to be anywhere in the world that have expertise. And it just blew incredibly fast. It was huge. And then the idea was came about maybe six, seven years ago, started, there was an interest to package this up and provide the best of the best courses to, to companies. And then very quickly, the company has grown nearly, it's almost closing out on $400 million of revenue. We went public a couple, you know, I guess a year and a half ago now, and the growth's just been outstanding. For the price point, it's one of the best returns that organizations are finding for maintaining and attracting key talent, which is ultimately what our biggest cost line is at any company for the most part is really your talent. And the big companies are always scared about the smaller, more nimbler organizations eating their lunch and trying to steal their employees and beat them. And and the small guys are just trying to compete with the big folks and trying to attract the right talent and get the skill sets. 
And so focusing in on actually for professionals, which is both what the marketplace does as the Udemy business size does. Certainly there's courses on beekeeping and bread making and all the rest of it that's out there. But really the heart and soul is for any professional that's learning to advance their career. And sometimes it's sponsored by an individual. You just go and buy a course. Sometimes it's by a manager just for a small team. And sometimes the CEOs and, and L&D leaders and CHROs that are out there saying this is critical for the success of our business and the growth of our internal talent. So it's really exciting. It's the first real company I feel like there's a lot of meaning to, and it's attracted just a great group of people. And it's just been a lot of fun. And it's a feel like we're just scratching the surface of what's out there based on what our customers are coming in and asking us for. Yeah, it's great. We're a, Caspian's a 25 person company. And as we're growing, one of the first things that I spent my formative years in the army, you do lots of training in the army. And we really wanted to figure out how to train our internal employees, but like, you just don't have time for that. Like you don't have time to like create an agenda and set all that sort of stuff. And the idea that, Hey, we can send a certain course to a bunch of different people and then they can take it and then we can get together and talk about it. Oh my goodness. Like what a revelation. I wish I had this when I was an officer in the army, you know, it's such a cool go to market because you have so many people that find it done it in the past. Employees can, you can have that sort of bottom up thing that happens and you can also have the top down motion. So I'm really interested in your RevOps org. How do you approach RevOps for a sort of go to market like this? And how do you organize your team? I think what I, I love about enterprise SaaS businesses in general is there is no one right answer. There's no one way to do it. Nobody's figured it out. There's so many talented people, for example, that went through Salesforce back in the day. But even at Salesforce, we made tons of mistakes, but there was a lot of wind behind our back and we made a lot of right decisions back then. And the folks that certainly most of the folks that predated me and were more senior to me and had more influence. But the idea being is there's no one right answer. And so at any company I've been at, there's the same goal is how do you scale efficiently and effectively? And there's only so many levers you have, but ultimately it's which order do you pull those levers and when and what's the right time. And that to me is this algebraic problem solving that's really fun and allows every day to think about, okay, what should we be doing differently? How can we think about this? And for all the other folks that are in this world, there's a lot of great kind of support groups or, and so on, but we're all thinking and sharing ideas and trying to come up with, with that next best thing. But again, similar, I think we're scratching the surface. The way that my organization is set up is really, there's a couple different areas. There's a functional operations role, which is aligned to a business lead. And so that person's responsible for working with the head of marketing or the head of sales or head of customer success. And the goal there is to be the person that knows as much about their business as those business leaders and to be somewhat of an advisor and provide recommendations based on the health of their business of what, what they should be doing next. If they had one more dollar, where would they spend it? If they had one more hour, what would they do with it? And it's about figuring out what's the right element. And so we have those pieces. We have the more operational sides of technology and processes there's deal desk enablement, deal desk enablement, functional ops, and the technology and, and processes. And so there's fundamentally eight teams within our GTMSO. And I said, there's probably room for a couple more. One area that we don't have yet is a product ops team. And I always say ops, but it's really, there's a kind of, sometimes a connotation that ops is just more technology and administrative. And I feel like there's the value we try to focus on is really the strategy aspect of it, which is we have access to a lot of the data and what's going on. And the idea behind that is it's not just about delivering a dashboard. It's about just saying here, what does this mean? What should we be doing and why? And be grounded in the data behind that answer. And so what's fascinating, what I like about this in the role is that when these organizations, these ops teams used to report into their business lead, you had this conflict of interest. You had this idea that if I'm reporting to the sales lead, it's hard to challenge that person. And so the great thing about my role is that all I'm thinking about is how do we increase the value of Udemy, not just one individual unit, because every decision you make then cascades through the other organizations. And so if you're going to do something in marketing, how does that apply to sales and, and the partners and customer success and product? And so thinking through all those lines and connecting it as far as, listen, what our president wants to do, I'm trying to figure out how do we make that a reality and or is there another option? And so it's exhausting on a daily basis because there's so many things out there. 
And it's an exercise in prioritization of what are the most important things we should be focusing on, an exercise in alignment. I have this picture I use on a lot of slide decks when I talk about my team, which is just a bunch of geese flying in alignment and then a bunch of geese running into each other. And it's that's fundamentally it. Because there's no one right answer, the idea is, are we directionally all going the same direction? And is everyone on board? And there's a statistic out there that 1% or less than 1% of VC-funded enterprise B2B companies make it to $100 million in revenue because it's really hard to scale. One of the ways I believe, and I'm not the first person to say that, is, is that I think it's around the alignment of leadership and the communication across those teams and making sure they're all working to the one communal goal. And where I see a lot of challenges, particularly in companies I work with that are on the smaller side, is they haven't really got that alignment. And so each individual department is heads down and focused on building and they pick their heads up and they're very disparate. And so part of this is, listen, we know it might not be the right answer, but it's definitely over this way. It's definitely not over that way. And so my team is aligned to different parts of the business, but ultimately the communal goal is what should we be doing next to make the company scale? Because you blink an eye and all of a sudden you double, triple your size and it's tough to go back and retroactively build something to scale. And then once you get too big, that's when companies start to falter. And so there's this constant view from my team about what's out there, what we're thinking about next quarter, next year, and what should we be doing today to make sure that we're successful then. I love the geese, the geese alignment thing, because that's what it feels like. A lot of silly geese that yeah. get aligned. Anything unique about your RevOps organization? I know like Udemy, obviously very unique company. You have I can't imagine the website traffic that y'all get. Just that alone makes it complex. I don't know if there's anything. I think every one of us that I've talked to, every other leader, and that kind of approaches a little bit differently about how they group things together. There is a definitely unique aspect where we have individuals, individual professionals coming into the marketplace and looking just for a course or something just for themselves. And then thinking about also like, how would we address that for a Fortune 50 company that's interested in doing that? So there is an element of balancing and trying to underline the prioritization. So I think it's a little bit more complex than just a typical straight B2B enterprise company that's focusing on that. There's also another element to Udemy, which I think is very unique, which is our product, our instructors. It is the fundamental value behind the organization. These incredible instructors that are everywhere in the world creating these incredible courses and iterating on those on an hourly basis to make sure that they're always the best and up to date. And so there's this other element too. It's not just a product. Our product is people. So how do we make sure that those folks can be as successful as they can be? But as far as our, how our org is orchestrated, not too different, I would say. I think if I was at a different company, I might think about it very similarly in terms of the overall structure. But there is a piece that there's a whole other side to the business. One side is really more of a, an individual professional, one's an enterprise professional. So you do have to wear kind of two lenses as we think about that. And historically, the company was kind of focused on two different things, and that's very quickly becoming one. And we're finding a lot of customers were like, why'd you become, why'd you decide to come into the business side? And as a company, actually, you know what? Our CHRO took a course three years ago and loved it. And so we started talking about this. She's like, you know what? You got to go talk to Udemy. And more often than not, then that's the thing. So there's this whole element of this marketplace is this awareness engine and allowing people to do things on their own. But then when it comes back to their broader careers, there's a lot of transference back and forth. And so trying to support that both from thinking as a consumer model and as more of a B2B model is unique. There's a few companies out there that do that, but I think ours are really tightly aligned. And so I think there's this transference of once you're at one, you're in a career in a company, but your career continues outside of that company. So we have professionals coming and going as, you know, with one company and then moving on their own and then, and then arriving at another company. And so how do we make them successful? And what's that future for them of like, here's their skills that they have. How do we recognize that? Or how would a future employer want to think about, oh, am I looking for somebody's resume or am I really looking for somebody's skill set? And so there's so many interesting ideas out there. And ultimately, there's a finite number of resources. And so a lot of this is just the prioritization. And it's a different topic than it might other be at another company. But I think fundamentally, a lot of our orgs uh, tend to be very similar. I would say that there's a couple things out there, which is some in terms of where our org aligns to, which is under the strategy, which is under the president of the company versus sometimes I've seen it under a CFO or sometimes it's under a CRO. And 
What I worry about in those instances is you're not still focusing on the broader picture. The president just cares about the success of the overall company, not just a department. Finance is a great gatekeeper for us. It's good to have them not as part of my boss or my team because I can always use them, whether they like it or not, as, mm-hmm. as my guardrail to say, no, this is a finances policy. And oftentimes finance isn't thinking about the strategy of the business either. So alignment to whomever is ultimately making those strategic decisions. So I have seen roles pop up and other folks where they're reporting in different lines. I would fundamentally disagree with that. I think the more value is whoever is making the business case, that's where we're best aligned because we can help provide the insight and the recommendations to make those decisions for whoever that business leader is. All right, let's get into our next segment, Rev Obstacles where we talk about the tough parts of RevOps. What's the hardest RevOps problem you've had in the past year or so? Man, it just, it changes. I think the biggest one, and I think this applies to fast-paced companies, which is also why I love it. I can't complain because I think these are, it's the problems you encounter because you're growing really fast. So you really can't complain because they're good problems. So it's constant prioritization and reprioritization as we grow. A year goes by in a blink of an eye. We think about when COVID hit. Okay, great. So how are we going to think about when that time period is and when that's going to end and how that's going to impact the business? And it was actually, it was interesting. A lot of folks were taking time to rethink about their careers and retraining. And so we actually saw a huge spike in interest and demand. And then we had maybe about 30 minutes of calm. And then all of a sudden, economic considerations and wars and everything started happening and supply blockages. Everything is a little bit different. The challenge being is when you're building for scale and building over the next year or two, there's so many of these unknowns, which for ultimately a period of maybe like eight or nine years prior, we didn't have a lot of major disruption, at least in the technology space. And now we're having it one after the other. And so I think the idea is, are we still, is that still the right direction? Is the geese still aligned and going? Is that still north? That's, I think, probably one of the biggest challenges that we've come through this. What's it look like? I've been able to have conversations with whom I would say are the smartest people in the room. And they're looking back at me and said, I don't know. It's out of my control. There's probably two people in the world that know really the answer. And so just focus on what you know, what you can control. And so that's the idea is like, there's so many shiny objects out there that we can chase and we can fix. My dogs and squirrels is another great example, right? You constantly be chasing off on those, bringing it back down to like, what are our real main priorities? If we can do nothing else, what does that come out down to? And I would say that's one of the more persistent things that I've continued to have to make, but certainly the macro conditions of what that impact is going to be. And with SaaS companies, you slow it down and it takes a while to, to grow back up. And there's so much potential for this business that... I'm always more on the optimistic side of saying, okay, so if this, whenever this starts creeping back up again, what levers do we pull to help accelerate that? And so that's the stuff that keeps me up at night or rather wakes me up early in the morning. I can't remember the last time I had to set an alarm because I just, <laughs> I wake up and it's like a million ideas running through my head, which is exciting. And as long as that continues, like this is the right sort of role for me. All right, let's get to our next segment, the tool shed, where we're talking tools, spreadsheets, and metrics. Just like everyone's favorite tool, Qualified. No B2B tool shit is complete without Qualified. Go to qualified.com right now and check them out. We love Qualified dearly. Go check out qualified.com. Okay, what is in your tool shed, Noah? We got everything. Let me tell you this. If you were a vendor and you didn't sell to Udemy in the past six years, you missed out on a paycheck. <laughs> we have a Salesforce instance everywhere from like Gong, Marketo, Braze, to Sales Loft, Six Sense, LinkedIn Navigator. We have Gainsight on the sales. We have so many tools. It's more and less of a tech stack and more of just a name, a product, and probably we have it. This is a challenge. The fact that a few of us got together a few years back and we started meeting up regularly and we would have CEOs or founders come and give us their VC pitch, not that, give us the funding pitch, not the sales pitch. But why should leaders in the go-to-market and RevOps space, why should they be thinking about this sort of tool, what's happening? Because what I found is, is it's really hard to keep up. And I feel like I'm not close to it as much anymore. And the challenge, if I want to go learn, I have to go talk to somebody who's going to refer me to their AE, who's going to talk to this. And so how do I quickly digest that? And that's a challenge that we all face. I try to pick and choose and talk to friends who you're looking at and who's the next greatest thing. 
I think there's, we're scratching the surface of those things. And I really want to, I don't think we're using any of our tools optimally. I think I hold all of our tools to a greater standard than maybe they do themselves. I have, I have expectations. I think if I leave this job, I may have to just go build something because I think everyone's kind of like gnawing around the, the edge of it, but like kind of getting at the core of ultimately what we want to know as an organization is what's our number going to be next year? What's it going to be our next quarter? What's it going to be the quarter after that? And then you start clicking into it and like, what are the things that contribute to that, that we can actually affect today to help us get there, whether it's on the customer side with customer retention or customer health, or is it on the pipeline side? Is it on the handoff side between the inside sales and AEs? All these areas to look. And I feel like everyone's sending me a bunch of data, but I want to know, who, like, tell me who my best, like, gone. tell me who my best reps are. Yeah. I get all the data. Like, tell me what a best, good, great call looks like. I get all the data, but then I have to go do it myself. And so there's a lot of circling in the market, and I feel like there's going to be a lot of, a lot of M&A this year in this space because there's limited real estate and there's too many folks trying to vie for that front system. We use a company called Boost Up for forecasting. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, I used to come with Larry for a couple of guys. And I think that's kind of the real estate because that's what people are looking at every day. That's what your, that's what your e-staff is reviewing to take a look at is how are we doing on the quarter? How are we looking on pipeline? How are we looking on coverage? And then everything kind of backs into that. And okay, if this is down, then tell me why, then how do I break into that? Or if we need this, then why? And so I find that very interesting or the companies that are using Slack and just, there's no interface. It's just, it's almost ask Alexa and you get a response about your account status or something like that. And it's like, I love that idea because just interacting with a chat bot versus having to go to a tool is, would be a nirvana in my stage. So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of data, not as much prescription or somebody telling me what's what really good is or where I should review. But that's why I have an analytics team on my staff to, to go and dig in and try to find those trends. But it's exciting. If you're in that space that's selling to the go-to-market tech stack, it's going to be a wild ride. I think there's going to be a lot of cool things. People are starting to really get it. And so I'm excited about what there is. I just hope that I'm aware of what that is so <laughs> that I can have those conversations with folks. And it, it's tough. I, I get a lot of emails, as we all do in our inbox. And, and sometimes I do send an email back saying, I wish you all the best. You're young in your career. I don't know what this means. I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what this terminology is. Don't use a script. Just speak in English. And what core value are you try, are, do you think I care about that you're trying to touch on? If people did, I would probably buy more stuff. Honestly, it's a travesty, but everyone's got to cut their teeth, I guess. Any metric that really matters to you that maybe it matters to other people, maybe it doesn't matter as much, but something that you are a couple things that you single out? There's a metric that we kind of came up with using one of the vendors a few companies ago. And there was this element when I was starting sales strategy, which was I realized that I was spending more than half my time talking to the marketing team and focusing on pipeline. So what I realized very quickly is that what's happening today, what's actually transacting right now, you have very little control. You have a little bit of control over it, but mostly in the negotiation aspect. But you really have control over things in the future. And so one of my favorite metrics is pipeline coverage. Coverage and conversion have a lot of interesting terminology, depending who you talk to. But in my world, it's how much pipeline do you have today that's scheduled to close at a certain time in the future? And how are you tracking to that? Because that's the one of the best early predictive signals as to the health of your business. You can look at how your bookings, what your revenue look like right now. You can look at are people generating pipeline in general, but then how are you looking out for future quarters? And as in our rule, I think that's one of the things that we really have to focus on is trying to anticipate what that's going to look like. And so being able to extend your prediction model out there is something that I think is very popular. So pipeline coverage, is it predicting churn and predicting where we're going to end a quarter at with from a bookings perspective? Obviously my favorite number, if yeah, I'm going to go with a favorite metric, because you have a great team that's doing that and they're getting pretty precise in, in figuring this out. And I would say the second, probably that's, that's number two, the number three would be, it's this football field that I stole from back in the finance days when we we're looking at an M&A and you're doing valuation which is effectively just a bunch of different methodologies to identify a metric. And you kind of line them all up in American football field and and you kind of see where there's overlap. So if I'm trying to do a prediction on where we think we're going to end the quarter, I have about seven different methodologies that help me determine where I think we're going to end up. 
and using all of those to kind of triangulate what's that kind of band of where that confidence level is. That one is the one that it's one of the first things I put together at a company when I go there because it gives me the all the different inputs, whether the sales team may think it's higher, whether the an- analytics says it's going to be lower. You can put all those together and see where the overlap is. And so I love doing that. I call it a football field. There's probably a better term for it, but it's a great way to understand how the business is shaping up. All right, let's get to our final segment here. Quick hits, quick questions, and quick answers. Quick hits. Noah, are you ready? I'm, I'm ready. Number one, if you could make any animal, any size, what animal would it be and what size? So being in the Bay Area, I'm fascinated with sharks, and my wife's from Florida, and i become fascinated with, with alligators. I would love to take one of those and have just like a miniature, hmm. have an aquarium with a bunch of tiny little sharks swimming around. That would be awesome. That would like, sure there'd be some random stuff, but like as far as like just personal entertainment to have something that's a great white, but it's six inches long. So that would I be love a lot of fun. Do you have a uh, RevOps prediction for the future? So it's interesting. The RevOps name, I feel we it was stolen <laughs> because RevOps already existed. Revenue Ops was this organization that sits in finance. That RevOps team is the team that's usually doing like, kind of like the RevRec stuff. So I've, I shifted to the go-to-market strategy in ops, which I think is a better representation. I know why RevOps got there. It's because the revenue leader and the sales leader naming convention. I would say maybe it shifts more towards that. I would say the trend within the teams is that probably more of them align to the business strategy leader. And I think it continues to grow as an organization. I mean, I'm biased, right? Obviously, I'm talking about my job. But I think in terms of what we're able to see across the business and the advice we have because of that, yeah, I think is very impactful. And I think the folks that are coming into this business come from all walks of life, all variations and whatever. And I think that also adds to a bit of, a, of the creativity. I think it just be, continues to grow. I think it becomes a mainstay. The tools that I'm seeing that sell to this are also, I've seen them growing too, because they're getting traction in non-tech companies that are starting to grow these roles. So I think just continued growth. Last question here. What advice would you have for someone who is newly leading a RevOps or a go to market ops team? That's a great question. If you're newly leading, I would say fundamentally, I would start as a leader. I would go into every of the areas that is generating data for you. So if you have a pipeline model, an operating model, I would go back and reconstruct those yourself. Because at the end of the day, you are accountable for what they say. And back when, again, another reference back to the finance days, but anytime you took over a project, you always started from scratch because you don't know what was in there before and you don't know how that's going to impact. And so as a leader, you need to be sure and you need to be able to go into the details, into the weeds when you need to and challenge your team because you've been there, you've done that and they're still learning. And for you to be a best guide for them and helping them along the way is to be able to challenge them. But if you haven't gone through that path and done it, you got to jump into the details. So in this spectrum, there's so many different parts that could be rolling into you. Chances are you didn't come from all of them. You probably came from one avenue. So really understand your weak points of where you have the least amount of experience so that you can get into the weeds. You can have the competent conversations because you're only as good as your team. If you're not helping leading the team, then they're going sideways. So that would be my best advice for everyone. Noah, Thanks again. Great chatting with you for our listeners. Go check out Udemy for Business. Go just get it for your team. Get some courses going. If you haven't already, you're going to thank yourself. No, any final thoughts? Anything to plug? Nothing to plug. Just great to be here. I'm, I love that there's all these organizations that are focused on, on this world and how to get people in there and how to be successful. And I would say the plug is to all those folks out there is, is make sure you're focusing on the strategy and not the operation side. Only. Make sure you're thinking about what this means and how to convey it. Other than that, I had a great time. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Noah. Take care.